Hello, everyone, and welcome to part four of our RSET webinar series, Satellite Observations and Tools for Fire Risk Detection and Analysis. Here's a little reminder of our over webinar agenda. Um, last week, we had two sessions on pre-fire conditions related to climate, hydrology, and vegetation. And session three this past Tuesday, Dr. Pa Drs. Pawan Gupta and Ana Prados covered the different ways fire is detected by satellite, as well as several available smoke and aerosol data sets. In today's session, we'll shift gears a little bit and focus more on the modeling side. Um, you'll be hearing from me. Um, my name is Melanie Follett Cook. Uh, I am a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, D.C. That's me on the left. And Dr. Ana Prados will cover this material in Spanish during our afternoon session today. So in today's session, um, we're going to understand the different ways fire emissions are estimated using satellite observations. We'll also identify several different fire emissions data sets that are readily available and locate several global and U.S. air quality forecasts. Um, if you have questions uh, during today's presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box. We'll answer them in the order they were received at the end of today's presentation, and then we'll post the Q&A document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about why we want to model smoke from fires and what exactly we mean by that. Fires and the smoke that results from them can have a wide variety of important impacts. Smoke particles can affect the Earth's energy budget in several ways. Smoke can scatter and absorb radiation and also alter the properties of clouds and their lifetimes. Forests are usually sinks of carbon, meaning they take in more CO2 from the atmosphere than they release. Carbon is taken up through photosynthesis and stored within plants, dead organic matter, and soils. However, when large areas are burned, forests can become a carbon source by releasing more carbon than they absorb. Fires are a significant source of trace gases and aerosols or particulate matter. Fires emit pollutants like CO, NOx, and particulate matter. CO is carbon monoxide, and NOx stands for oxides of nitrogen. In fact, fires contribute about 50% of global CO emissions, about 20% of NOx emissions, and about 40% of black carbon emissions, and about 74% of organic carbon emissions. Black carbon and organic carbon are types of particulate matter. Fires, or sometimes it's referred to as biomass burning, um, they're also responsible for a lot of the interannual variability in these species. Smoke from fires also reduces visibility and contributes to tropospheric ozone formation, another pollutant. Smoke also degrades air quality, leading to negative health impacts ranging from exacerbation of asthma symptoms to premature death. Each year, globally, millions of premature deaths are attributed to poor air quality. The vast majority of negative health impacts is caused by exposure to fine particulate matter. Modeling the emission and transport of smoke is the only way we can forecast future conditions and plan accordingly. So we're going to take a little step back and talk about modeling. Three-dimensional atmospheric chemistry models are usually grid-based models meaning they divide the atmosphere into a set of three-dimensional grid cells. The size of the grid cell determines the spatial resolution of the model. The smaller the grid cell, the more detailed the information and the more computing power needed to run the model. Models can be run at a variety of spatial scales, from urban models that focus on only a city, to regional models covering a domain like the United States, to global models. Because of the computing power required, in most cases, if a very high resolution or 
smaller grid cells are needed, the model domain will be smaller. But at agencies like NASA and Europe's ECMWF, global models are being tested at about one kilometer spatial resolution, which is pretty cool. Atmospheric chemistry models simulate the emission, transport, chemistry, and removal of trace gases and aerosols within each grid cell. To do this, they need information about the physical state of the atmosphere or meteorology, information about the chemical interactions within each grid cell, and information about the emission of trace gases and aerosols into the atmosphere. Some examples of emission sources are power plants, cars, and fires. Once emitted into the model, these emissions are subject to transport and chemical transformation. But how much is emitted, where, and when these emissions are released into the atmosphere is critical for the accuracy of air quality predictions. So how are emissions from fires calculated? And how do models simulate fire and smoke? Well, first, there has to be a fire. We know from session three that satellites and other instruments can detect active fires. But what about periods of time in the past when there were no satellites or further off into the future? For those scenarios, specialized fire prediction models use special schemes or parameterizations to predict the occurrence and spread of fire. But for this presentation, we're going to focus on calculating emissions from fires that have been observed by satellite. As we heard a couple slides ago, emissions from a fire consists of a combination of trace gases and aerosols. In addition to how much, where, and when the smoke is emitted into the model, other information is needed, such as how high did the smoke get? How long did the fire last? Hours, days? And did the emissions change over the course of the day? Observations can tell us some of this information. For example, active remote sensing measurements like LIDARs can give us information about the height of a smoke plume, but they don't have a lot of spatial coverage on a given day. And geostationary observations can give us some information about changes in fire strength throughout the day or from day to day, but clouds typically always interfere with our ability to see fires. So, when we don't have observations, a model makes assumptions about each of these factors. Two kinds of satellite observations are used to calculate fire emissions. The first is burned area, which reports the spatial extent of an area that's recently been burned. You'll hear more about these products during our post-fire session number six. These observations are not usually available in near real time from satellite. The second kind of observation is the detection of thermal anomalies from active fires. Session three covered these observations in detail. These product files contain two pieces of information important for the calculation of fire emissions, the location and time of the active fire and the fire radiative power or FRP. We'll talk up more about FRP in a couple of minutes. These observations are typically available within an hour or so of observation, so they can be used in near real time applications. The picture on the right shows a map of the burned areas detected by MODIS and active fire detections from VIRS from September 1st to September 15th, 2020. This corresponds to one of our California, to one of our case studies uh, over California. This was made using the GWIS mapping tool that I'll show a demonstration of later. You can visually see the difference between the two products. And I wanna highlight how much larger the number of active fire detections than the areas of burned area. So emissions from fires, again, contain a mixture of a lot of different trace gases and aerosols. Emissions from fires include all the important species here and more greenhouse gases, trace gases, aerosols, but the actual composition of the emissions from a given fire will be a function of the fuel source or what is burning. Is it a forest, is it a tropical forest, is it savanna and grassland? 
is it shrub, um, and the environmental condition. The amount of a particular species emitted, whether trace gas or aerosol, is directly related to the amount of dry fuel burned through an emission factor, like seen in this equation. Emission factors vary depending on biome or vegetation type. So in other words, for every unit mass burned of, say, tropical forest, an emission factor tells us how much, for example, PM2.5 is estimated to have been emitted. As you can imagine, emission factors are very uncertain. Most have been calculated in laboratories or through in situ measurements and are then applied to broad regions that might have more varied vegetation. There are two primary ways that groups estimate the second part of that equation, or the amount of fuel burned. One is through the use of burned area, or the burned area approach. These use observations of burned area, such as the modus burned area product, or make assumptions about the, the amount of burned area based on the location of an active fire. Examples of these types of emissions data sets include GFED and FIN, which we'll cover in a little more detail. The second uses the observed thermal energy of a fire. Examples of these types of emissions data sets include QFED, GFAS, and FEAR. We'll cover QFED and GFAS in a little more detail here. Using the burned area approach, the emission of a species is calculated as a function of the burned area, or how much area burned, the mass of available fuel, the fraction of that fuel that has burned, and the emission factor for that species. Here, an emission specifies a mass per unit area per unit time, which can also be referred to as a flux. You can see from this equation that in order to calculate fire emissions using this method, you not only need information about fire, you also need information about the amount and condition of the vegetation. FRP-based approaches utilize the fire radiative power, or FRP, of a fire. The fire radiative power is the rate of radiative energy emitted by a fire. As explained in session three, sensors detect fires by looking for enhancements in the four and 11 micron bands. FRP is calculated using the difference between the brightness temperature of an identified fire pixel and the surrounding background at four microns. Studies have shown that, you, that burning dry vegetation yields a similar amount of energy regardless of the type of vegetation being burned. Using this concept, the emission of a species, S, is a function of the FRP, the emission factor of that species, and a constant, alpha. This alpha represents a constant relating FRP to the amount of dry fuel burned. This method has the advantage of not having to estimate the total fuel load or combustion completeness, or the amount of fuel that actually burned. Examples of emissions inventories that use this method are GFED and GFAS. Other fire emissions inventories, such as the NASA FEAR inventory, relate FRP directly to the emission of a given species through the derivation of emission coefficients. So now we'll review a few commonly used fire emissions inventories. I've given a couple examples. And first, I've included a quick reference table showing the four fire emissions inventories I'll describe today, along with the fear inventory on the right, which I'm unfortunately not covering for the sake of time. The satellite product, time period, spatial resolution, references, and websites are all listed in this table. So first, I'm going to talk about GFED. The Global Fire Emissions Database, 
or GFED, is probably the most well-known and widely used fire emissions data set. Other emissions data sets typically use GFED to scale or correct their own emissions. In GFED, fire information is obtained through the MODIS burned area product and therefore follows the burned area methodology. Vegetation information such as NDVI and fractional tree cover, which were discussed in session two, and meteorological information such as air temperature, soil moisture, and solar radiation are all used as inputs to the CASA or Carnegie Ames Stanford approach uh, model. This is a terrestrial carbon model. CASA then calculates fire carbon emissions as a function of vegetation type. Trace gas and aerosol emissions can be calculated at that point using emission factors that GFED provides. GFED offers actually two emissions data sets for download. The GFED version four prim primarily uses the MODIS burned area product, along with other satellite observations to create emissions for the pre-MODIS era. However, MODIS has a fire detection limit of about 100 meters squared and therefore misses smaller fires. In GFED version 4S, where the S stands for small fires, the MODIS one kilometer thermal anomalies and surface reflectance are used to detect smaller fires not captured in the burned area product. The algorithm then derives an associated burned area for these smaller fires and adds that to the burned area detected by the burned area product. Both products are available monthly with factors allowing for scaling to daily and three hourly timescales. All files are in HDF or HDF5 format and the website has Python and MATLAB data readers. Because both GFED 4 and GFED 4S use the MODIS burned area product, they are not available in near real time. But there is a new GFED near real time product in development. Uh, it's not currently available for download as a complete data set, but can be viewed and downloaded in part using the GFED website analysis tool, which I'll demonstrate shortly. In this new methodology, fire detections from beers are used to map a burned area of slow moving forest fires with a spatial resolution of about 550 meters. Comparison with other burned area maps indicate that this works best for forested ecosystems. So how much do the addition of small fires really matter? Um, when we look at the difference between GFED 4 and GFED 4S, we can get an indication about how much the inclusion of these matters to the calculation of fire emissions. These plots show monthly fire carbon emissions from GFED 4 in red and GFED 4S in gray. The inclusion of small fires generally means an increase in fire emissions, but the magnitude can vary with region. As one might expect, the largest increases are seen in regions with a lot of agricultural fires like Southern Africa in the US. As a reminder, agricultural fires tend to be smaller and might not be detected by the burned area product alone. GFED has a fantastic website full of great features, including uh, the Amazon dashboard and analysis tool, information on their global fire atlas and a place to download GFED data. So I'm now going to switch over to the GFED website to show you the different features and how you can make a time series map like this and download the data. Okay, so this is the GFED website. The tabs at the top will take you to the different various um, pages and there's information and references listed here as well as contact information. If we click on the data tab, there's information about the GFED 4 burned area without small fires and GFED 4S emissions with small fires. 
other data, as well as figures. These are the GFED basis regions. Um, you can see they divide up all the land into these different regions. I point that out because that's going to be relevant for the analysis tool. They have some pre-made plots of burned area, fuel consumption, and carbon emissions, annually averaged from 1997 to 2014, as well as some of the plots that I just showed, the comparison between GFED 4 and 4S, um, as well as carbon emissions from different, um, different types of fires, boreal forest fires, temperate forest fires, heat fires, agricultural waste, et cetera. There are also there are all these pre-made plots ready for viewing. The Amazon dashboard shows a newer site using the that newer Veers method. I was talking about the GFED near real time. This has some information on the burned area of fires as well as distinguishing between different types of fire here. Savannah and grassland, small clearing and agri agriculture, understory, and deforestation. And you can also download the latest data here. There is a note, um, they are undergoing updates currently. So just um, take that into account if you're gonna poke around. There's also the Global Fire Atlas. Um, the reference for that is here. Um, this is a data set containing information about fire size, duration, speed, and direction. You can explore this data uh, online. There's a data viewer here where you can look versus day of burn, speed, fire line, and direction. An overview, data summary, and a user guide, um, and a place to download the data, as well as uh, some sample, file, sample files and references. There's a, there's a lot to explore here. Today, I'm going to focus on the analysis tool. Clicking on the GFED analysis tool, um, can show us uh, their current estimates of carbon emissions from GFED. Go here, because I'm going to focus on the Western US, um, kind of bring it back to our case study. The first thing we want to do is click here about the tool, and that'll give you information about data sources, um, a little bit more information about the VIRS near real-time estimates, um, and other uh, sort of resources about this tool. Looking back here. So as I said, this is viewing carbon emissions from GFED. So bringing it back to our case studies, let's change. the date that we'd like to view to mid-September 2020 during, um, during that bad fire season in the Western US. And here we can see the gridded, that's why they look like squares here, gridded GFED emissions going up here, we see that you can change the base map from the map to an aerial view. And here, you can either draw a polygon, a rectangle, input a GeoJSON shape, or upload your own shape file to calculate the GFED emissions within each of these shapes. For today, we're just going to draw a rectangle around these emissions around Northern California. And it labels that area one. We could change this label if we wanted to. So we're gonna focus our analysis on this rectangle. Here, following the instructions, um, we can add a chart by clicking this. 
and and select our region. So here's where uh, I why I wanted to point out the different regions I showed before. So you can calculate um, averages or totals for different GFED regions or different countries. For today, we're going to focus on our chosen area one. And we can examine the data for different quantities. We can look at burned area, emissions, fire counts, fire counts versus emissions. Today, we're going to look at years near real time emissions. And we'll look at look at carbon first. So these carbon emissions are what the emissions of everything else is going to be based on by applying the emission factors. So we're going to look at 2020, September, and the time scale. We will look at daily and in a line chart. We click create chart. And we can see the evolution of carbon emissions throughout the month, it's taking a minute. And here, if you mouse over, it tells you each data point in gigagrams carbon. You can download these by pressing, by clicking this, which will bring up a separate tab with these uh, quantities, area, year, and these are the day numbers, or the days of the year. If we want to plot a different quantity but see it in comparison with the one we've just plotted, uh, we can add a plot by just saying we want it to share the space here by clicking here and add a chart. And let's say we want to now look at PM 2.5, which might be a little more intuitive than carbon. All of our other parameters are set, create a chart. And now we can see PM 2.5. And again, this data is also downloadable. So this, this analysis tool is a really useful resource if you're curious about how a current season's carbon emissions compare with the previous seasons. Um, it's just a, a really nice intuitive tool to be able to actually view the emissions. So going back to our presentation, uh, we're next going to talk about the FIN fire emissions database. So the fire inventory from NCAR, or FIN, uses MODIS observations of active fires and land cover to calculate emissions using the following equation that might look a little familiar. You'll notice that even though FIN uses burned area, it does not use the MODIS burned area product. The MODIS thermal anomalies product has a spatial resolution of one kilometer squared. When a fire pixel is detected, the FIN algorithm assumes the burned area of that active fire pixel is one kilometer squared. Exceptions to this are for grassland and savanna fires that are assigned a burned area of 0.75 kilometers squared. Burned area is also scaled using the MODIS vegetation continuous fields product. So for example, if a pixel is 50% bare soil, the burned area will be 0.5 kilometers squared. The fraction of biomass burned is assigned as a function of, of the fraction of tree cover from the VCF product. FIN version 2.2 emissions are available as text files daily at one kilometer squared spatial resolution from 2002 to the present. Emissions calculated using both MODIS and VIRS fire detections are available from 2012 2019. For those users familiar with chemistry transport models, the FIN website 
offers emissions of trace gases and aerosols that have been mapped for specific chemical mechanisms used in 3D chemistry transport models, namely the Mozart 4, SAPRC99, and Chem chemical mechanisms. There are also utilities to grid fin emissions for use in wharf cam or other global models. This plot on the right shows fin fire emissions of carbon monoxide for September 12, 2020, gridded to half a degree. Again, fin fire emissions are calculated in real time and they're processed as inputs to chemical forecasts run at NCAR, the National Center for Environmental Research or Atmospheric Research. So next is QFED. The Quick Fire Emissions Data Set, or QFED, is used in the NASA GEOS forecast system. QFED uses satellite observations of FRP from the MODIS Thermal Anomalies product to estimate gridded fire emissions globally. The IGBP INPE Vegetation Classification Data Set is used to determine the type of vegetation category, select the emission factor, and assign the FRP to the corresponding QFED vegetation class. QFED, this is an important step, uses modus aerosol optical depth to calculate and tune biome-dependent emission coefficients and determine their best value by minimizing discrepancies between the models and the satellite-derived AOD. So because of this, these scaling coefficients make up for potential weaknesses in the underlying chemical transport model. This makes the corrected biomass burning emissions somewhat model-dependent because they were developed using GEOS. Therefore, using QFED emissions in other models requires caution and an understanding of this aspect of the results. QFED emissions are available in near real time. In addition to the near real time emissions, a longer historical record data set is also maintained and can be downloaded at the website shown here. The historical product is updated on a monthly basis and it is available from March 2000 to the present. QFED products are available at 0.1 by 0.1 degree and quarter degree degree spatial resolution in net CDF format. Next, uh, GFAS. Global Fire Assimilation System, or GFAS, emissions are used in the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, or ECMWF, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS, forecasts. GFAS uses a methodology very similar to QFED. In this equation, alpha represents a constant that relates FRP to dry matter fuel consumption. This is taken from an earlier version of GFED. These alphas are also a function of biome. It should be noted that GFAS doesn't use the tuning step to aerosol optical depth that QFED does. Daily GFAS emissions are available from 2003 to the present in GRIB file format. The files themselves contain information on injection height, which is derived using a plumerized model, FRP, and emission gases. The figure on the right shows G emissions of PM2.5 for September 2020 over Western US. This map was from the GWIS mapping tool, which we'll cover next. GWIS, or the Global Wildfire Information System, brings together current and historical fire-relevant information on regional and national levels. Session two introduced this tool and discussed land cover and fuel type. Here, I'm going to briefly walk you through the website and show you how to create a map like the one shown on the previous slide. I'm going to click back over.
So here is the GRIS website. Scrolling down, there is the current situation viewer and country profiles and data and services. I'm going to first click on the country profile. So this has some really nice ready-made maps. Um, switching to country overview. Here, um, it's focusing on the European continent. I'm going to change to North America. And it has already selected the United States. But if I scroll down, you can see each of these has an arrow that you can click to view the different subregions of each country. And in our case, we're going to look at California. And you can see some information about land cover. Um, clicking on the maps, you can see some nice pre-made maps for monthly burned area. You can view different months and you can change the year here. Cumulative burned area, fire frequency, median day of burning. Going down to country charts, you can look at how a current year compares with an average over uh, previous years. So in this case, we're looking at 2019 as compared with the average of 2002 to 2019. And you can change that here to view only um, a single year. Well, updates. We have yearly burned area and number of fires, the seasonality of those fires. Come up. While it comes up. Oh, there we go. Yearly burned area by land cover. Average monthly burned area and seasonality, monthly burned area versus historical. A lot of nice analysis here. Um, average monthly fire size per year. And what's nice that also about each of these charts is by mousing over this icon, you can either download an image, uh, PNG, JPEG, SVG, or PDF. Uh, download the data in different formats or print um, other data downloads and documentation is available here. Um, and if we go if we click home, going back to the main site, and click on the current situation viewer to see the cool mapping capabilities that the site has. So again, we're gonna keep going with California, the Western coast of the US. Um, there are some tools here on the right. Clicking here, you can change the base map. So if we just go to base streets, And there are several um, types of uh, variables available for plotting. Instead of forecasts here, we're going to go to observations. Um, so the fire emissions available here are GFAS fire emissions. So if we go to a custom date range, we can go back to September of 2020. And let's view cumulative emissions from the 1st to the 30th. And let's look at emissions of particulate matter. And 
So using this, we can visualize particulate matter emissions from GFAS over this period. Clicking this, sorry, the one at the bottom shows the legend uh, for, for the variables uh, plotted. I also used the GWIS tool earlier to show uh, active fire detections and burned area. We can also view those here. So if we look at active fires detected by MODIS and those detected by VIRS, and you can see how many more fires VIRS detects. And if we also, we can also overplot burned area from both MODIS and VIRS. I'm choosing this because this is only available until the end of 2019. And I think we need to unclick F to view that. And these are the burned areas. So this is a really, this is a really neat tool also for visualizing GFAS emissions, um, as well as uh, fire danger forecasts, lightning forecasts, and uh, land cover information. Going back to our presentation. So we've heard about two different methodologies for calculating fire emissions. Both the burned area and thermal energy techniques suffer from similar uncertainties that deal with the potential omission of fires and the inherent uncertainties in the emission factors. The burned area approach also includes uncertainties regarding the type of fuel, the estimate of biomass, and estimations of the fraction of fuel burned. The FRP approach includes uncertainties in the estimation of scaling factors and coefficients used to convert FRP to emissions. And I just want to also note, VIRS has the much higher spatial resolution compared to MODIS and detects three to four times the amount of fires. And many of these emission inventories are only just starting to incorporate VIRS active fire detection. So how do all of these different emissions data sets compare? Um, in this study by Xiaohua Pan, um, which is a, a nice um, overview of comparing each of these different data sets, I, I recommend her paper as well as the references I included for each of the uh, fire emissions inventories shown in the table, in the reference table earlier. Um, in this study, she ran the NASA GEOS model for one year, 2008, using each of the fire emissions inventories listed here. This figure shows the global monthly mean organic carbon emissions from fire, and the totals are shown in the table on the right. All of the inventories show the same general cycle throughout the year, but you can see there's quite a lot of variability among these different data sets. QFED and FEAR consistently show higher emissions than the other inventories, both globally and for specific regions, not included in, in this slide. This is very likely because they are tuned to match aerosol optical depth observations from MODIS, although in, in different ways. GFED4S shows the lowest emissions of all of the data sets, even compared to an earlier version of GFED. This is due to changes in the combustion calculation and emission factors between versions of GFED. So now in this next section, we're going to move from the fire emissions inventories to the models that they're used in to predict air quality. Operational air quality forecasts are used to provide the public with health alerts. This is very important as the World Health Organization estimates that air pollution accounts for about 4.2 million deaths each year. 
air quality forecasts also provide region, regional haze advisories for private and commercial aviation, inform emergency response, and can supplement existing emission control programs through identifying scenarios that could benefit from temporary emission reductions. Research air quality forecasts, like from NASA GEOS, are also used to support field campaigns uh, provide a test bed for modeling and assimilation techniques and provide boundary conditions for regional models. In this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about air quality forecasts and smoke forecasts. As their name suggests, air quality forecasts forecast pollutants that are important for air quality, like PM 2.5. They include not just fire emissions, but emissions from other pollutant sources, like power plants or cars. Aerosol forecasts tend to forecast aerosols only, and composition forecasts forecast both trace gases and aerosols. A smoke forecast can be a component of an air quality forecast or a standalone forecast. In a standalone forecast, fire emissions are usually the only emission used so the impact of fires can be isolated. The first part of this presentation focused on how fire emissions are derived from satellite observations of fire and vegetation. But as I mentioned earlier, fire emissions themselves are one piece of accurately forecasting the transport of smoke from fires. First, from session three, we learned that active fire detections are primarily from the MODIS and VIRS sensors on board polar orbiting satellites, like seen in the GIF shown here. This means that they only get two chances per day to view a fire over a given location. If there are clouds, or if the fire isn't strong enough or large enough to be detected at the time the satellite passes overhead, that fire will not be included in the model forecast. Along those same lines, if the satellite observes a fire one day and doesn't the next, that doesn't necessarily mean that the fire is not still there. The fire could be obscured by cloud cover or thick smoke, or again, not be strong enough to be detected at that time. So models make assumptions about the persistence of a fire or how long a fire lasts to try and account for this. And the incorporation of geostationary observations can help with these current two limitations. In the absence of direct observations of the height of a plume, so I just remember most satellites observe aerosol optical depth, which represents the optical thickness of aerosols in the entire atmosphere column. So models often make assumptions about the height and vertical profile of the smoke plume. Some models use the energy of a fire to calculate a smoke plume height. Others simply inject all of the smoke into the planetary boundary layer or the atmospheric layer closest to the surface of the Earth. The altitude of, a, of smoke is a very important piece of information when forecasting plume transport and developing new near real-time observations of plume height and incorporating those into model forecasts is a current active area of research. There are many air quality forecasts available, too many to describe in one presentation, so I've chosen just a select few to highlight as examples. So the first model I'll talk about today is uh, the NASA Geosystem. Uh, the Geosystem produces analyses, assimilation products, and forecasts of weather and air quality using the most current GS system. It's maintained by the NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Officer, GMAO. To support NASA satellite missions and field experiments, GMAO generates near real-time atmospheric products and distributes them to a broad community of users using their framework for live user invoked data or fluid software. And I'll show uh, some examples of that in a little bit. Two forecasts are currently offered. 
um, the GS Forward Processing System, or GSFP, forecasts weather, aerosols, and carbon monoxide. This animation on the right shows GSFP aerosols for December 2019. Each type of aerosol is assigned a different color here, as shown below the animation. The reddish color are carbon aerosols that are most often associated with fire emissions. You can see the model transporting fire emissions from QFED uh, in Eastern Australia. This is a really cool animation, and the entire animation can be found at the link um, seen on your screen. The GS Composition Forecast, or GSCF, forecasts both trace gases and aerosols. Both are available hourly at about 25 kilometer spatial resolution. The GSFP forecast assimilates both weather and aerosol satellite observations to issue 10 day forecasts twice daily at zero and 12Z. The incorporation of satellite observations through data assimilation corrects the initial model state and leads to more accurate forecasts. The GSCF forecast does not assimilate observations, but instead runs a simulation constrained by the previous day's meteorology from a version of FP that has assimilated data. Then it forecasts out five days. CF is run once a day at 12Z, and both systems use the QFED fire emissions that I described earlier. The NASA Fluid website offers a place to see various maps, such as datagrams, two-dimensional and different vertical layers of GS FP forecast output, and a place to download the output itself. So you can see here on the left, there are options for datagrams, weather maps, what they call chem maps, but that's where the aerosol plots can be found. Um, and other, other features, and then the data access is there on the bottom in various forms. So clicking on the chem maps or 3D chem maps bring you, brings you to these pages. On the chem maps page, you can select from different variables to view, such as the surface mass or aerosol optical depth of different aerosol components, uh, such as dust, organic carbon, and black carbon. You can also choose the forecast time and region to view. On the 3D Chem Maps page, you can view different aerosol species, or you can choose to view PM2.5, PM10, or total particulate matter at different pressure levels. And for those not used to thinking in terms of pressure levels, um, as a reminder, pressure decreases with altitude, so higher pressures are closer to the surface. And on both of these pages, you can also animate um, these maps and download these images. Clicking on the datagrams will show you a forecast profile in time at a given location. So this datagram shows the forecast for Washington, DC. The vertical profile for the given quantity is shown along with the winds and forecast cloud cover there on the top. And if you've chosen an aerosol variable to view, the forecast for the speciation is shown there in the uh, middle panel below the vertical profile. So going back to our case studies, this is a special visualization created by the NASA Earth Observatory team, showing the transport of QFED fire emissions within the GSFP forecast during the September 2020 fires in the Western US. These plots show the mass of black carbon in the atmosphere column on December 14th, 15th, and 16th. And one interesting aspect of this series of images is the presence of Hurricane Paulette off the east coast of the US. On the 15th, in the middle panel, the, slope, the smoke plume encounters the hurricane, and by the 16th, the system has moved on and allows that smoke plume to extend further east out over the Atlantic. Going back to the GS CF forecast, um, the CF forecast uses constrained meteorology from the GSFP system, along with the GS CHEM chemical mechanism. GS CHEM is a community-developed global 
three-dimensional model of atmospheric chemistry and consists of over 250 chemical species and over 700 chemical reactions. The movie on the right is just a small snapshot of a longer movie from the NASA Science Visualization Studio showing a lot more species. It's pretty great if you want to check it out. You can see it at the link on this slide. Uh, CF output is available every 15 minutes for the surface, and this forecast has been run since January of 2008. You can find maps and datagrams of CF output also on fluid. The maps include either surface concentrations of CO, uh, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and PM2.5 for different regions, as well as column quantities. The ECMWF Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Surface, or CAMS, provides five-day global composition forecasts of aerosols and other pollutants, twice a day at 0 and 12Z. Like GEOS, CAMS assimilates weather and aerosol observations to constrain the initial model state. CAMS also assimilates satellite observations of carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. It's available at about 40 kilometers spatial resolution and about 10 kilometers spatial resolution for a select domain over Europe. CAMS uses the GFAS fire emissions I described earlier. Forecast maps are available on the website. An example here is shown on the lower right. This map shows the PM2.5 forecast and different forecast times, regions, and, and variables like PM10 as opposed to PM2.5 can be chosen using the, those gray tabs um, at the top that are actually on the website. CAMS forecast visualizations uh, can also be found on the windy.com website. So this is a GIF taken from Twitter, actually, showing the CAMS total column carbon monoxide forecast for September 15th, 2020. You can again see the transport of smoke across the U.S. and out over the Atlantic. And CAMS actually forecasted this smoke to reach Europe just a few days after this. So those are two examples of global aerosol and composition forecasts. And now we'll take a look at a high resolution regional smoke forecast for the United States. The NOAA Rapid Refresh or RAP model is a continental scale assimilation and modeling system operational at NSEP or National Centers for Environmental Prediction. The RAP domain shown here at that large green square, has 13 kilometers spatial resolution and covers North America. RAP is complemented by the high resolution three kilometer high resolution rapid refresh or HER model, which covers smaller geographic domains over the continental US and Alaska. Both models are run hourly and the HER assimilates radar data every 15 minutes. So this, this is just a reference table summary, summarizing some of what I just described. Um, both systems for fire emissions use both MODIS and VIRS active fire data. And they calculate emissions of PM2.5 in a manner very similar to QFED, but um, no tuning to AOD has occurred. Uh, model output can be accessed at the websites shown at the bottom row of the table. HER actually offers a pretty nice visualization website for its smoke forecast. The layers available to view include forecasts of surface visibility, vertically integrated smoke. So this is, means basically the amount of smoke in a one meter squared atmospheric column. Um, and they also have near surface smoke. Near surface smoke is shown here as PM2.5 in units of micrograms per meter cubed. 
fire detections from MODIS and VIRS can also be overlaid. And in this screenshot, I selected to view near surface smoke and active fire detections. And you can see the very detailed plumes forecasted by that very high resolution HER model at three kilometers. And you can obviously animate uh, the forecast using the controls on the bottom. So once again, returning to our forecasts of smoke from fires in the Western US in September 2020, these plots show the vertically integrated smoke forecasts for the RAP on the left and the HER on the right. The HER model especially is very detailed because of its high three kilometer spatial resolution. And I'll leave this running for just a second because if you look closely in California, you can actually see the pulses from individual plumes in this, uh, in this animation, which is pretty neat. The HER smoke and RAP smoke forecasts can also be viewed using the University of Wisconsin Real Earth site. Um, Real Earth is a visualization tool and app that animates fire-related model output, observations, and other earth science data. Here, I've chosen their fire detection collection and selected to view fire detections, the HER near surface smoke forecast, along with large fire incidents from the US Forest Service. Um, I thought I would throw this tool in there because not, it doesn't only have fire information, but other uh, earth science data. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty neat site. And so this is not a forecast per se, but I wanted to show one last mapping tool today. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, Air Now Fire and Smoke Map. Um, this displays real-time information from ground monitors, it has information on fire detection, um, and smoke plume locations. And this site is updated every 15 minutes. Um, large fire incidents are shown as those little fire icons and come from the U.S. National Interagency Fire Center's active incident feed. Satellite fire detections from MODIS, VIRS, and GOES are shown as yellow dots. Smoke plumes are shown as gray contours and are taken from NOAA's hazard mapping system, uh, which detects smoke using GOES true color imagery. This map also displays data from three types of air quality monitors. Permanent monitors are shown as circles, temporary monitors are shown as triangles, and low cost sensors uh, are shown as squares. And they're colored according to an air quality index calculated specifically for PM 2.5. The color definitions are shown here on the lower left. And if you click on an individual monitor, it will show you the air quality index, or you can also choose to view the PM 2.5 concentration for the past 10 days or so. So again, this isn't a forecast, but I wanted to highlight this really great mapping tool uh, because it's great for looking at the near real time state of fires over the US and, and other parts of North America. So those are all, that's the presentation for today. Um, I've put contact information for all of today's trainers uh, shown here and provided links to the training page, the RSET website and our social media. So if you're on Twitter, you can follow us to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. And um, just a little bit of logistics for those interested in a certificate of completion there will be three homework assignments throughout the course of this six-part training. Um, answers are going to be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSA website that I showed in the, in the previous slide. And the due date for all three homework assignments is June 8th, 2021, which is two weeks after the last webinar session. And a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend the live webinars and complete the homework assignment by that June 8th deadline. And 
uh, and that certificate will be emailed about two months after the completion of the webinar series from the website shown here, from the email shown here. Sorry. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. And we'll now start the Q&A portion. Thanks. Okay, so now we'll bring up our Q&A document. Okay, so if you have questions now, feel free to um, still enter them into the q and I'll sort of tackle these just one at a time. Okay, is it possible to detect active fires through SAR imagery, for example, Sentinel-1? So I believe SAR imagery can be used to detect burned area, but not thermal anomalies associated with active fires. So in other words, um, you know, active fires are typically able to be detected in near real time, whereas burned area is measuring the area burned by a fire. And so, you know, just because of that definition tends to lag um, the ability that takes longer than detecting an active fire. If that makes sense. Um, so I don't know of a, I don't know that Sentinel-1 or SAR imagery can be used to detect the thermal, thermal anomalies from fire. Um, on slide eight, you mentioned burned area is not available in near real time, though at a two kilometer resolution. So it's the thermal anomalies associated with active fires that are available at about two kilometers spatial resolution from the geostationary GOES 16 and 17 satellites. Um, it would seem band seven, which is the four micron, uh, would provide an estimate of burned area thoughts. So I think, I believe other GOES bands and information can be used to calculate burned area, but I don't believe that this is available in near real time. Um, I just want to note VIRS data, on the other hand, um, is very high resolution. And looking at the day to day progression in the VIRS active fires is a method that's actively being researched um, as a method to calculate uh, the change in an area of a fire from day to day. Is FRP only for the four micron channel or any other channel? So FRP is typically used uh, using the four micron channel. That's the primary channel used in detection of an active fire. And also um, the four micron is not as sensitive to, it, it's sensitive to both smoldering or lower temperature fire and also flaming fire, a little bit more sensitive to flaming. But so the FRP that you calculate from it um, is not as sensitive to um, if there's a combination of both from a given fire. That's another reason for the four micron over another uh, channel. What studies have shown that burning dry vegetation yields the same amount of energy regardless of vegetation type? Can you please provide references? Sure. So here's the Kaufman et al. paper explaining about um, FRP. And then here is the Achoku, uh, Charles Achoku and Norm Kaufman's paper um, where they establish the relationship between the energy emitted and um, aerosol emission. Is there a definition for dry vegetation? What is the criteria to be classified as dry vegetation? Um, I mean, I'm not sure what to say other than dry vegetation um, is vegetation without moisture. Um, I think to classify, like, I'm not sure of a criteria used to classify it, but um, dry vegetation will be, you know, for example, uh, debris um, on the 
forest floor or dead grasses. And I believe in labs, they dehydrate fuels in order to calculate emission factors. But I don't know of an exact definition or criteria. I'm sorry. I'll see if I can find out more information about that. The GFED data captures prescribed fire actions and can and can gather prescribed fire data, areas, emissions, et cetera. So the GFED data will include information about both burned area and emissions from any fires that have been detected by the satellite data sets that are used to uh, generate the emission data set. So if a prescribed fire is large enough to be detected either by the burned area product or the MODIS thermal anomalies product, it will be in the GFED 4S emissions database. But you know, that information is you know, spatially aggregated up and reported on a quarter degree by quarter degree grid. Um, so for not, not on an individual fire basis. Um, so if you wanted to know about prescribed fires in particular, if you knew generally where they happened, you, you could get information from the GFED. Uh, emissions database. How are large burned areas acquired by MODIS and VIRS respectively? Oh, I think I misread this question. I thought it was asking about spatial resolution. So the MODIS burned area product is available at 500 meters spatial resolution, just FYI there. But um, if, the, if the question is how they're calculated, um, I'll say a little bit about it now, but session six, I think we'll cover this in more detail. Um, the, the land burned by a fire will have um, different values of spectral reflectance and it's changes in those over time that are used to detect the area burned by a fire. Um, in the case of peatland fires, is it is burned peat part of the emission and smoke calculations in the presented methods and tools, or are these limited to burned above ground vegetation? It's a fantastic question, and I should have included information about that. Um, so, for GFED and GFAS, those fire emissions do include emissions from peat fires. QFED currently does not, and basically what that means is. If QFED defects, detects a fire in a region, um, say Indonesia or you know, Boreal Asia and Siberia, where peat fires are likely, um, instead of being assigned an emission factor for peat, it will be assigned an emission factor according to the biome that it is in and, and be associated with the above ground vegetation. So it, it's improved. You know, we're, we're working on um, improvements like that over time, incorporating uh, peat fire emissions. Um, I don't believe FIN includes peat emissions in their, they don't include it in their list of emission factors in their documentation, but I know that they're about to release a new, um, their new documentation for their FIN version 2.2, I believe. Um, so I, I could be wrong about that. Um, Exactly. Well, that's a nice thing to say. <laughs> I'm worry, I'm wondering if there is a possibility in GFED to find out what types of plants were burning so that one can correlate PM 2.5 emissions from grasses or trees. Okay. So the, the GFED emission files themselves do include an estimate of how much carbon is emitted by the different vegetation types and, and they're listed here. Um, so anything finer than that is not available from GFED, but you could take, um, GFED does tell you in general the amount of carbon emitted. And so if you have a finer scale vegetation data set, you could use uh, that and assign uh, finer scale emission factors if you have them to specifically calculate PM 2.5 emissions on a, on a finer scale. Question 10. Oh, FRP is radiation from a very narrow wavelength, example, four micron channel. 
how could FRP be used to calculate emissions? We do not, we don't need the radiation from different wavelengths. So the, the studies linked above and this Achoku et al. 2005 reference, they show a direct relationship between the FRP and the aerosol emission rate. And so the FEAR emissions database, which I, I apologize, I didn't have time to cover today, um, uses a derived coefficient of emission to convert the FRP to emissions. Um, there, the process, um, a complete description of that emissions database is here at this reference for the FEAR emissions uh, data set. Question 11, why does FRP use four micron and not the other channel? So again, so the four micron wavelength is uh, sensitive to both flaming and smoldering fires um, and is the primary active fire detection channel. So FRP in this channel is less sensitive to any ratio between uh, flaming and smoldering fires. How did the GWIS classify fire season? in the case of California during the demo. I'm not sure I understand what this question is referring to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's a question about this session or I know they demonstrated GWIS in session one. So I'll, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really understand the question. Um, in slide 36, comparing little organic carbon emissions from 2008, which one is likely the correct estimate? So that's a great question. And which fire emissions data set you choose really depends on your application. So example here, GFED is available over the longest time period uh, from 1997 to 2016, and in some time in the near future, they'll release uh, their GFED version five. Um, but that is known to generally underestimate emissions from a fire with respect to other um, databases. So typically you can compensate for that by scaling those emissions up. And when you compare, um, you know, FRP based emissions with the burned area, typically you have to scale GFED up by an order of three or four. Um, so if you want a long time period, you know, GFED is appealing. Um, and, but if you're running a high resolution regional model, um, thin fire emissions might be more appropriate. They're available at one kilometer resolution. Um, so I think it really depends on the scales uh, that you're studying. Do we have correction factors to cater for uncertainties in fire emissions using burnt area and thermal techniques? Um, so again, you can use, you can scale up, you know, emissions from burned area techniques to agree with other observations, such as aerosol optical depth. Um, and that's where this scaling on the order of three or four that I mentioned above comes in. So if you put, if you run a model with GFED uh, fire emissions, typically you have to increase those fire emissions on the order of three or four times in order to match the aerosol optical depth observed from MODIS. Um, so those, there, are, there isn't, you know, a, one correction factor. Um, to transfer between the two techniques that any difference between them will likely be a result of a, a number of different factors and then wouldn't be something like a constant value. How can the uncertainty of carbon emissions be calculated and which product is the most accurate among the others? Which product has been identified as being the most accurate for tropics fire or is each product discovered to be site specific? So again, this is going to depend on your application. Um, so 
end by the metric with which you evaluate it against. So in other words, if you're running, uh, if you put a fire emissions data set into a model, you know, what evaluation, what data set are you, you going to use to evaluate it? If you're going to use aerosol optical depth or aeronet observations, then the FEAR and the QFED um, emissions databases, which have been tuned to match AOD, will be the most accurate. If you're thinking more in terms of ground level concentration, um, that will that's something that will definitely vary um, with by region and with each emissions data set. And I'm sorry, I don't have a an answer as to this one is more accurate in terms of um, say PM 2.5 emissions. Um, when you say the satellite only views one location twice a day, does it mean the satellite could view the Earth's surface in 12 hours? Yes. Um, so depending on the orbit and the field of view of the satellite, it can view the entire Earth or part of the Earth. So VIRS views the entire Earth every 12 hours, whereas MODIS has some gaps in the tropics. When we're talking about um, variables like aerosol optical depth, however, you only get data for the sunlit portion of that orbit. So if you don't get two measures of AOD a day, you get one. Um, I should love the peroxy radicals in the GSCF model. I am wondering if it is possible to download this data as a CSV file from individual fires. For example, I would like to know peroxides in Northern California from the 2020 fires. So the GOCF model um, uses QFED fire emissions. Um, so you could download QFED and examine what species are available uh, from the QFED fire emissions database um, for the model forecast, which might have more detailed um, chemical species like seen um, in, in that movie. Um, you can download um, CF output. I don't know how detailed the chemical output from GSCF is. Um, I'm going to have to follow up on how much of their output they save. But um, if you want to take a look um, before I do, um, you can go to the websites, the fluid website that I showed, and download some CF output and, and see what variables are, are available. Um, but I but I will say um, no no fire emissions data set that I've talked about today uh, has fire emissions from individual fires. Um, they're all grid based, so you know individual fires can be much smaller. But then any they they represent emissions within that grid cell. What are the most detailed spatial resolution data sets for emissions? So the FIN uh, fire emissions data set, and I should specify that I mean globally here, um, these global fire emissions data sets. Um, so FIN has the highest spatial resolution of the ones I discussed today. And I, I believe, I don't know of another global emissions data set with a higher resolution. Can GEOS detect sulfur hexafluoride. So I, I am, I'm assuming, so if, if this is meant to say GOES, I don't believe GOES measures F, SF6. And if it means GOSCF and does it simulate SF6, I'm not sure. I can follow up and, and write a more complete answer um, after. 
um, and transport of smoke and other particles are corresponding lifetimes of each particle taken into account. For example, if NOx has a shorter lifetime, how is that taken into account in models? Yes, it's absolutely taken into account. So chemical transformation um, in smoke is, is an active area of research. Um, whether that's, you know, and that'll depend on the complexity of, um, of the chemistry within that model. Um, for example, the aerosolization of particles, um, you know, the in-plume chemistry, the aging of the aerosols, um, that's all taken into account um, specific to the sophistication of the chemical mechanism. Is MODIS's FRP information available since 2000 and 2002 by thermal anomaly detection, or is it more recent information? No, I believe MODIS FRP is available uh, for the entire MODIS time period. Pawan, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, can you separate? Oh, sorry. Pawan, did you have something? No, I was just saying that is correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you separate prescribed fire data from wildfires? Or do you treat them equally? The different types of fires are gathered in the total data. That's correct. Um, the most we can really uh, distinguish between is by the type of vegetation burned. Um, and the other way you might be able to detect some prescribed fire is if, um, you know, crop or agricultural fires do tend to be, you know, purposefully set. And so we can detect uh, crop vegetation, um, you know, distinct from, say, grasses and savannas versus forested. So in that respect, you could distinguish it. But if, if you're talking about sort of a set prescribed fire within a forested region uh, or um, like land use practices, no, we, we can't distinguish um, between those kinds. Is there any link with the IP approach for fire emissions and GPS? Moreover, how can we get information in regards to other African countries like Suzanne's for Sudan for fire emissions and forests. Um, so if this, I'm not sure what the first question is asking, um, but the fire emissions data sets that I've talked about today all include information or they all include global information. Um, so they'll certainly be available for any country in Africa. Um, yeah. And, um, and as far as forecasts, uh, two of the forecasts I covered are also global. How do we estimate the emission factors and how do we verify their correctness? <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, so emission factors are calculated either um, in the laboratory uh, through controlled experiments, or they can also be calculated uh, through field measurements um, by actually sampling um, smoke from active fire plumes. Uh, how that's exactly done, I am not um, an emission factor expert, <laughs> so I, I can't speak with a lot of authority on that. Um, as to verifying their correctness, again, um, basically there are um, compilations of emission factors in the literature, and uh, I can after the webinar, I can include some references. And you can see, you know, both from laboratory experiments and from different field measurements that um, there is consistency um, 
between these uh, different measurement methods and places where these measurements are taken. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be sort of more specific than that. Um, what is the minimum pixel size that can be taken into consideration for forecasting fire emissions? Um, so the fin fire emissions are the have the highest spatial resolution of all of the fire emissions uh, data sets I've shown here. So if you have a forecast model, um, I would say in theory, you can you know, put fin fire emissions in if you're running at a one kilometer squared uh, resolution. And even if you were running at a finer spatial resolution, if your model was running at a finer spatial resolution, you, know, you could still forecast um, it's just that your fire emissions would be on that one kilometer squared grid. Um, where can I find information on the spatial and temporal resolution of MODIS and VIRS? Um, so again, part three has some information on that. And um, Pawan and I uh, had a webinar um, on both MODIS and VIRS aerosol uh, information last year, um, and I can link, I can put the link uh, to that here for when this document goes on the training website. And it looks like that's all of the questions. Thanks everyone so much for coming to the webinar again today and for your great questions. Um, hopefully you'll join us next week, our next uh, our next session starts our post fire, um, our post fire webinars. Um, so please join us next Tuesday. And you can see here if uh, you want to email us a follow up question. If I wasn't able to answer your question, or maybe I misunderstood it. Please feel free to email me um, or the other trainers. And hopefully we will see you back next Tuesday. Thanks everyone. <laughs>